Hey guys, welcome once again to another World Audiobook. So excited to have you here. Today, uh, we've got another special treat for you. Last week, we did an indie author uh, segment from Sarah Marie. Remember to check her stuff out at sarah-marie.com. But today, we've got another awesome uh, indie author segment. And this one comes from a guy that I came across on Twitter, which was really cool to just be able to connect with him there. His name is Zachary Wilson. And you can check his stuff out uh, at... Zachary Wilson. And that's Zachary Z A C H A R I E Wilson. So, and I'll put all the links in the show notes as always. But he's got a book called Morningland. I think actually I'm going to just go ahead and read you the book description so you kind of know what we're getting into. And then I have the first three chapters. Zachary's been kind enough to let me narrate those and share them with you guys. And I just really hope that you enjoy it. And if you do, that you'll go ahead and check him out and uh, check out his work and uh, help him and help support him in his author work there. So here's the series description for the book Morningland. Fleeing the destruction of Earth's solar system. The gargantuan Seamus V crash lands on a mysterious ocean planet. Rick Langley, a young man who spent his life fending for himself, regroups on a tropical island with the only survivors, the students of Class 331B. Here, the classmates discover that the blazing sun never sets, but hovers ominously over the horizon. There is an abundance of luscious fruit on the island, and even sweet nectar with inebriating qualities, doling the senses of the stranded college kids. They think they found paradise, but Rick is not convinced. Armed with his brainy new friend Benjamin and the rebellious wildcard Jess, Rick will venture out into the unknown to send a distress signal. But the demons of the uncharted depths have other plans, as do the demons that lurk within Rick himself. Alright, I don't know about you, but that sounds like an awesome book, and I definitely want to check it out. And I have been checking it out, which you can do as well by going to chinillo.com slash series slash morningland. Link is in the description. I'll spell that, spell that out for you. C-H-A-N-N-I-L-L-O dot com slash series slash morningland. Zachary said that's the best place to go ahead and check out the book. And uh, it, the Chinillo.com there is a subscription-based reading platform uh, where Morningland is being uploaded as a weekly series. So if you're into that sort of thing, that's really, I think it's a cool way to do it where you don't just have to read the whole book. You can read like a week's worth and then kind of get that anticipation for the next installment. So if interested, uh, you can test it out and you get a 30-day free trial on Chinillo and you'll have access to plenty of stories in addition to this one. Plus, hitting the subscribe button on the series is a huge help to Zachary as he gets a little bit of a kickback per subscriber, uh, which is a great way. Like, indie authors, like, we're... we're struggling along we're trying to get our feet under us and uh it's not like you start writing a book and boom you're a millionaire <laughs> far from it but um you know we're, we're a community we're helping each other uh do everything that we can to uh make a difference and uh, get our writing out into the world which is what it's all about so that's why i wanted to do this for zachary to read this and just in and to just let you guys know about Morningland and get you interested in uh checking it out So now, without further ado, I give you the first three chapters of Morningland. Morningland by Zachary Wilson Chapter 1 I always thought my first time on the beach would be on Earth, and I didn't think it would involve a 700 million ton spacecraft falling from the sky. Maybe that was too much to ask for. I'd never seen the entire ship all at once, until now, with my soaked sneakers pressing into the blinding white sand. Sure, we went over extensive diagrams in class, saw holographic pictures, watched instructional and safety videos, and I'd explored at least a quarter of the interior by then. But this was the first time I got a glimpse of the impossibly massive spaceship, top to bottom. Up close, anyway. The last time I got a look at it was four weeks ago, my last day on Earth. Cranked my neck skyward and got a brief glance at it. Then, I was ushered into a smaller vessel with no windows, just a black box with seatbelts, which shuttled a thousand of us up to the ship that dwarfed our tiny vehicle. The enormous ship was now plummeting helplessly from space. Seamus V. Too heavy to be efficiently built on Earth, Seamus V was constructed in space over a year-long period, just outside the planet's atmosphere. Eleven other Seamus ships just like it were constructed simultaneously, surrounding the globe from every angle, overlooking the desperate continent of hopeful souls. Each one was to house, educate, and transport eight million passengers apiece. The Seamus ships were, for the entire planet, priority number one. During my final few moments on Earth, I saw two of the massive spacecrafts as minuscule dots in the sky, like watchful eyes looking down on me. 
The design was almost like that of an old-fashioned blimp. Long, metallic, and tubular crafts. Nothing special to look at, other than the fact that they were spaceships. But no time to sightsee. I was hastily shoved into the little black box, and the wide metal doors clamped shut behind me. A puff of steam, and then darkness. That shuttle, and hundreds of others like it, was kept hidden from all but those of us meant to leave Earth. The chosen survivors. Why I was selected to live, to have the chance to seek out new and habitable planets while the rest of mankind was left to die, I'd never know. I'd seen footage of the shameless ships being built, and the debates, the TV specials, the riots that took place worldwide concerning who got to board and who didn't. Part of me wondered why it wasn't one of those protesters in my place. They sure seemed to want it more than I did. Two months prior to boarding Seamus 5, I was brought to and kept in a secret location with a large group of strangers. Somewhere underground and huge. Well, huge in width, anyway. I'm not very tall, and still, it felt like I would bump my head on the cold, featureless ceiling. It was a tunnel without walls, essentially. No walls that I could see, anyway. From one end of the stark metal room to the other, must have been miles. Couldn't even guess the shape of the room itself. It almost felt like a prison. Except people wanted to get in, not out. DNA identification was rigorous and regular, and security was tight, ensuring no impostors were smuggling their way off the planet. Over the next couple months, strangers trickled out the only exit, emptying the place more and more. Passengers gradually shuttled up to their respective Seamus ship via the little black boxes. We'd all been cut off from the rest of the world during this time, but I assume many attempts were made to hijack the vessels. I wonder if anyone succeeded. When the town-sized room had become harrowingly empty, they didn't even call our names as they did for every other group. I just heard, Anyone still here? You're the last batch. Truth be told, watching the population minimize every day while I stayed put, I began to wonder if I was leaving at all. Then, my last day on Earth finally came. I sat shoulder to shoulder with a thousand unknown faces, and only then realized we were all young adults, college-aged. I almost forgot that our ship was special. They were taking us to Seamus 5, our new home, school, and enormous space bus for 80-plus weeks of intergalactic travel. We plugged into the spacecraft and boarded. Not even a day later, all 12 Seamus ships left our doomed solar system, never to return. I never even got to see what our ship really looked like. But here, now, with my feet planted on this mysterious beach, I saw the entirety of Seamus 5 up close and in vivid detail. One-twelfth of humanity's last chance, our vessel of salvation, our Noah's Ark, our beacon of hope. I watched, in unspeakable fear, as all seven hundred million tons of it fell out of the sky. It's hard to describe exactly what I was looking at, but none of it was good. The gigantic rear thrusters that once propelled the ship were now dead. They'd been severed from the rest of Seamus V by cosmic violence I couldn't even fathom. Part of the enormous bow had been decapitated by the lengthy fuselage, creating a storm of shattered debris in between. I think... I think I could see bodies scattered among the pieces. Three colossal chunks of what housed eight million souls just minutes before were now hurling through the bright blue sky toward the ocean surface. Well, not the ocean surface. An ocean surface, I guess. I don't know where we are. I hadn't really had time to think about it. It wasn't Earth, though. I knew that but it certainly felt like Earth. My muscles, despite being beaten up by the escape pod's rough landing, told me that gravity here was nearly identical to Earth's, maybe even less powerful. The tree lines that overlooked the beach were comprised of tall, broad vegetation, huge in fact, thick and sturdy at the bottom like miniature mountains. Then the trunks essentially narrowed into a straight palm tree about several feet and climbed toward the sky. The sand that outlined my drenched shoes was fine, spongy powder. It reminded me of Earth's tropical destinations, the ones I'd seen commercials for, that is. The water I'd just emerged from, along with the rest of Class 331B, was cool, but not too cold. Possibly salty, but my senses were far too overwhelmed to know for sure. I was already drying quickly, though. The astounding heat wrapped around me like a suffocating blanket, rapidly sucking the moisture from my dark t-shirt. It appeared the sun's effects were amplified here. The sun. It hovered above the horizon stoically, which was just endless ocean as far as the eye could see, but it was currently eclipsed by the falling fragments of what used to be our ship. Seamus V, like all the other Seamus ships, was named after its famed designer, Dr. Philemon Seamus. 
He was hailed as a genius and a savior after he appeared with his cutting-edge designs. His face was plastered across the globe for Earth's final year of existence. Every screen, billboard, and magazine cover had the same odd figure on it. Tiny bespectacled eyes, a drooping nose, and hanging from his wrinkled face, a cartoonishly long white beard. Apparently, it was the only face left worth advertising. The architect reached true immortal status when he suddenly died, just after his blueprints had started undergoing production. As it turns out, his designs weren't exactly everything-proof, as we were told. Of the twelve ships that left Earth, two of them were designed specifically as college ships. Every other spacecraft ran an elementary and high school system, but there were two made specifically to be post-secondary educational systems. Seamus Five, for as long as it had lasted, was one of them. The idea was to educate the next generation on the essentials of rebuilding life and community on our new planets, introducing the potential necessity of extraterrestrial linguistics, all that jazz. Maybe they should have led with crash landing on a foreign planet 101. Water droplets fell from my eyebrows as I tried to unglue my sight from the shattered, free-falling ship. I managed to look away and assess the situation here on the beach. Based on my initial scan of the panic-heavy shore, I spotted no one older than 21 or 22 as survivors scrambled onto the beach. A few dozen students, some of them teenagers even, were running, tripping, crawling their way out of the agitated water. Our escape pod must have sunk into the sea floor by now. Benjamin, the lanky kid by my feet, suddenly coughed up a mouthful of water. I looked down to see him on his side, eyes closed behind his crooked glasses, breathing slowly. On his forehead, a big red bump throbbed viciously. He was a good kid from what I could tell. Smart. I wonder what that's like. I just dragged his unconscious body from the crash landing spot of the escape pod, which was about 40 feet out and just as far beneath the waves. I could still see the turbulence in the water from where we hit. Still mostly out of it, Benjamin stayed relatively motionless by my shoes. Our teacher was in the escape pod when we ejected, but I wasn't sure where he was now. I forgot his name, but he could still be underwater. Suddenly, a disturbing thought struck me. I didn't see Jess come back up. Jess sat two rows behind me in class. She was lovely, quiet, unfailingly rebellious, and that's basically all I knew about her. We'd never spoken before, but we'd all be dead had she not acted in the escape pod. I prepared to run towards the sunken pod and dive to where it had formed its grave, but she would have drowned by now. No, I had to at least try. Then a voice stopped me. It was her voice, calling my name. Rick! My heels swiveled in the sand, and I saw her, worse for the wear but alive. Her curly blonde hair was drenched and stuck to the sides of her face, her wet clothes spattered with grains of glimmering sand. Panting heavily, she pointed behind me to the horizon. I felt relieved. She was safe. But the look on her face quickly snuffed out that relief. Her expression was not a comforting one, as she continued to stare and point out to the ocean. I turned to look, and to my horror, I saw what she was pointing at. I was wrong. She wasn't safe. No one was. Two miles out from shore, give or take, the colossal bow of Seamus Five had struck the water. The gravity of the impact was impossible to comprehend. The enormous shaft and rear thrusters followed separately, just seconds behind it. I suppose the ejection angle of our escape pod resulted in us landing a few minutes before the mothership. The gigantic nose of Seamus Five split through the surface of the sea. A deafening crash made itself heard as the jagged edge of the bow plunged into the sea. The equally massive shaft and thrusters collided with the water a moment after. I just stood there and watched the unthinkable happen. It wasn't unthinkable because it was illogical. It made perfect sense. It was just the last thing I wanted to see. As the shattered guts of Seamus Five submerged violently in the distance, the ocean rose up angrily. A sixty-odd foot wave instantly emerged from the impact. It was like watching the world end all over again. The immense wave began crashing toward us, somehow both slowly and quickly, like a thick, haunting fog made up of a million gallons of water. The charging wall grew to dizzying height and moved like an unstoppable force. It rapidly started closing the distance between the demolished remains of Seamus Five and us. Twisted metal slapped and sank into the vast body of water. A sickening screech accompanied the impact. The ocean curled itself into a devastating weapon, and we were its target. I turned toward Jess. She stood as helplessly as me just several feet away. My head shook in disbelief as I looked into her frightened blue eyes. I don't know. I don't know what to... I muttered. I turned back towards our oncoming fate. The tsunami-like wave rushed towards us without remorse, as thirty-odd students, 
Just kids, really. Stood there staring at it, waiting for it, waiting for the end. Thirty-odd students standing helplessly on the beautiful beach of an unknown planet with no more ship, no more earth, no more hope. Everything else we knew had come to a swift end, and now it was our turn. We waited quietly, scattered along the otherwise peaceful shore. None of us dumb enough or smart enough to try and run. Together, but terrifyingly alone, we waited as our last minute ticked down. Then, Benjamin grabbed my leg. Chapter 2 Sitting near the back of the colorless Class 331B, by the protruding elephant glass bubble that overlooked a vacuum of space, I stared blankly at the quiz in front of me. It's safe to say I'd given up on this multiple-choice question. Just didn't see the purpose behind it. What is the correct order of planetary size, from smallest to largest, based off our current knowledge of the universe? A. Aurelia, Feminica, Goliatha, Saturn, Picard 9. B. Goliatha, Picard 9, Femonica, Aurelia, Saturn. C. Saturn, Aurelia, Femonica, Picard 9, Goliatha. D. None of the above. If so, place the proper order here. I pressed B, since that's what the last two answers were, and my splitting headache had returned. A red message that I was well acquainted with popped up on screen. False. The correct answer is C. Saturn, Aurelia, Feminica, Picard 9, Goliatha. I should have known that a planet with a name like Goliatha would be the biggest, but the truth is, I didn't care much about where we were going, what stars we were whizzing by, or the correct order of planetary size of anything. I didn't see how any of that information was relevant. Besides, Earth never felt like much of a home, and I doubted that a change of scenery would fix that. Aurelia is where Seamus Phi was supposed to land in about 80 weeks, or 76 weeks now. Not that I cared too much, but I think we drew the short straw when it came to the destination of our new planet. A red message pop up from earlier, correcting one of my many mistakes, informed me that Aurelia was pretty stormy, pretty cold, had a higher level of gravity than Earth, problematic terrain with lots of ice and sinkholes, and in short, was pretty dull. They said we'd have to wear special suits most of the time when we went out. We tried on the suits. Tight, thick, not comfy. I wasn't really sure how they deduced all this information from so far away, but the magnifying technology and the discovery drones that went out into the cosmos had apparently done enough reconnaissance to deem Aurelia a livable planet, and apparently the most lackluster destination of the Seamus conquests. I heard Seamus 8 or 9 was going to a big warm planet, but I wasn't sure. I would have killed for some sun right then. A nice beach, maybe? I once asked our teacher why we didn't all just go there, and he said there was no guarantee that any of these planets would be habitable, and that 12 different conquests increased our chances of finding the right planet. No guarantee. Comforting. The black screen integrated into my desk notified me that I had completed the quiz, with a score of 58%. I can't say I was surprised, or disappointed. I submitted my score to the class system. Richard Langley. Confirmed submission, quiz number 12, 3.15 p.m., 4.15.2079. Confirm. I logged out of the system. Richard Langley, confirm, log out. Confirm. I sat close to the back corner of the wide, bland classroom and looked out the unbreachable window. It was ten feet high and triple that in length, but no matter how big the window got, the scenery was always blank to me. Some gassy star here, some swirling solar system here. It was just space, at a jillion light years per second, or something like that. In all honesty, I didn't even feel like we were moving at all. They said we would get used to the interstellar travel fast. Seems like I got used to space itself pretty fast, too. Nothing related to the cosmos, galaxies, or star system appealed to me in the slightest, and that was reflected on my assignments. The other students took their sweet time completing the quiz. Apparently, they cared about getting good marks, as if we weren't allowed on the planet if we failed, and I certainly was failing. But that didn't mean I was as dumb as my teachers or my classmates likely assumed. In my experience, it's always best to undersell your intelligence. Keep it a surprise. Bouncing around foster homes growing up, I developed the opinion that if a couple didn't want to adopt a dumb kid, then they shouldn't have a kid at all. So I played dumb, and as expected, received no special interest. That was all the proof I needed that no one loves unconditionally. Of course, that's not to say that I'm particularly knowledgeable either. My brain functions more in a practical, problem-solving manner. In terms of literature, I can't recite any poems or literary works from great authors like Twain or Hemingfield, if that's his name, or anything published by Dr. Seamus. 
but I took a look at a few bookshelves in my foster homes. Flipped through entire action-adventure stories to know your from your. Math and science are definite weaknesses, no fooling anyone there, and any retention of useless names and dates felt nearly impossible. Anything that felt purposeless became hard for me to invest myself in. The one thing I did know, without question, is that when it hits the fan, all the knowledge in the world goes out the window, and when things turn sour, I usually know how to handle myself. Nineteen years on my own made sure of that. Sick of the emptiness of space, I glanced over my shoulder. Two rows behind me, nearest to the exit, I saw Jess lean back and throw her feet up on the flat black screen covering her desk. She was wearing stylish sneakers with a colorful design, dark jeans, like mine but tighter, and an equally tight white top, the opposite of my t-shirt. Luckily, we didn't have to wear uniforms here. I wonder if those were the clothes she packed for Earth, or if, like me, she just took what was given her. The shoes definitely looked like a personal touch. I still didn't know what to make of this girl. Jess. Jess who? I didn't make an account on the school system, so I didn't even know her last name. But names don't matter. Can't say I know who gave me mine, or why. She was definitely pretty, though. Incredibly pretty, in fact. The type of pretty that makes you keep track of how often you look at her. I'm not particularly self-conscious, but any time our glances crossed, I couldn't help but look away and act as though I didn't notice her. But I did. I always did. Despite all that, it wasn't the sandy blonde hair or the vibrant blue eyes that intrigued me. It was her endlessly rebellious demeanor. Nobody bossed this girl around, and I liked that. Maybe she was even too rebellious, but better that than the other way around. Our grumpy teacher noticed her feet up on the desk and let out a loud sigh and a grumble, but nothing more. A few weeks into our journey, he quickly realized that cooperating with her was not an option, so he let her be. I'd never spoken to her before. I didn't speak to anyone, really. But from what I could gather, I figured she was kind of cool. And based on her attitude thus far, I also guessed that her quiz score looked similar to mine. After the rest of the students finally completed their pointless quizzes, the teacher gave us a half-hour break. As I made my way out of the characterless classroom with a throbbing headache, a big big boy named Ted bumped his way to the front of the other classmates. With his broad shoulders, he knocked over a tall and lanky fellow from behind. The boy fell down onto one knee and his glasses tumbled off. Ted is what you would call a class bully. Oh, whoops! He said sarcastically without even looking back. He exited just as carelessly. I don't like seeing that kind of thing. Bullies rub me the wrong way, and I made that known to them throughout my years. But on this ship... Crammed in here with all these strangers, I honestly couldn't care enough to make a big fuss about it. Not that it was something I would back away from, if the situation presented itself to me personally. I've had my fair share of fights as a teenager, and I've won more than I've lost. I'm average height and weight. Ted is over six feet tall and very broad. He had the size advantage. I had the experience. So I'd say that made us almost even. But tools like him aren't worth that kind of effort. Besides, he seemed to be the only bully around. Not that I got to know any of them, but most people on board seemed polite enough. The gravity of our collective situation sobered everybody up, I suppose. One of these polite, sober-minded kids was the poor guy he just knocked over. I stepped up and extended my hand to the kid, as Jess brushed by behind me. The lanky guy looked up at me, having just located his glasses, and grabbed my hand. I pulled him up to his feet, where he stood a good five inches taller than me. Thanks, he told me awkwardly, sliding his glasses back on. Just a little slippery there. I'll watch my step, I said, trying not to add to his embarrassment. He stuck out his long, bony arm, and the hand at the end of it seemed to want to shake, so I shook it. I'm Benjamin, he said. Pleasure to meet you. Rick, I said with a slight nod. Then I was already one step out the door, avoiding any further interaction with him. Time to head back to my cabin, grab some pain pills, and take a nap. It was just a few minutes away from class, at the stern of the ship. The layout of Seamus 5, as one could guess from the layout of the classroom, was quite plain. Long curved hallways that split off like veins, with intermittent sections of cabins, classrooms, cafeterias, and lounges dispersed throughout. This Dr. Seamus fellow covered all the functional elements down to a T, and the rest was straight and simple architecture. Before I could clear out from the cluster of exiting students, a broadcast came over the intercom. Usually, what emitted from the speakers was a robotic female voice. She regularly made the usual announcements regarding schedule changes or announcing emergency drills, of which we'd had two so far, but this time was different. The voice was that of a man, and Ukrainian. It was familiar. Attention all passengers, this is your captain speaking. I'd heard Captain Shevchenko speak just once before, 
The thick accent was hard to forget. He was as charismatic and charming as you'd expect from a captain. I'd never met him, but from what I knew, he'd been a good leader so far. I'd never met any good leaders in my life, though, so how would I know? Last time he had made a personal announcement, he was compelling and full of pep. But now his voice came through very grave, even trembling a little. At this time, we ask everyone to make their way to a viewing area and partake in a moment of silence for our fellow brothers and sisters back on Earth. It's... it's finally time. The intercom switched off abruptly, and the class fell into a bleak silence. No one moved for a second. No one said anything. But we all knew what he meant. It was something we all knew was coming, eventually. But no one wanted to think about it. No more putting it off. We all began to march quietly to the nearest student lobby. The group moved at once earnestly and hesitantly, an unspoken uneasiness mixed in a deep fear that lurked in the atmosphere of Seamus Five. We trickled into the nearest lobby, near the very back of the ship, a large oval with couches, tables, nutrition dispensers, none of which we were looking at. All of our eyes were fixed on the holographic projection in the center of the lobby. A familiar big blue sphere floated in its usual spot within our original solar system, the last time I saw Earth was the day we left. No magnifying technology required then. As we rocketed past the moon that day, I could still see it clearly. A little over a year ago, specialists detected a massive wave of energy sweeping across the galaxy. No one had any idea where it came from, nor could anyone say with certainty what it was made of, but it was completely destructive and unrelenting. The world's top scientists and astronomers watched it wipe out entire solar systems from light years away, and it was heading straight for Earth. It seemed unstoppable, plowing through distant stars and planets without a single sign of slowing down. In fact, it only seemed to grow stronger with every new rock and gassy cluster it devoured. The hope was that the wave would divert and dissipate before it reached us, but everyone knew that was a hollow wish. After exploring all other options, a global decision was made to get as many people as possible off-planet and heading toward interstellar safety, far out into the cosmos. A certain percentage of each nation's population, a vast selection of specialists and experts, and then the randoms, like me. That's where Dr. Seamus came in. With all the world's resources at his disposal, he designed the model of the Seamus ships down to the most innovative detail. Engines, shielding, durability, everything. His team of top designers, engineers, and scientists alike were there as a formality. Allegedly, his focus and intelligence were unmatched by all. The world watched as he emerged with the plan of salvation. Up until that point in human history, space exploration was merely a challenging project, an exciting adventure, not a necessity. This astronomical phenomenon had forced the hand of an entire planet. And now, that slow-moving, relentless wave of explosive energy, what the world came to call the Galaxy Killer, was mere seconds away from our solar system. It was a genocidal stampede of impossible proportions. I could feel my heart pounding through my chest. A spattering of students around felt it too. The vacuum of space may well have been right in this room, sucking the breath from all our lungs. The ship's magnifying technology captured every detail as we stood quietly, staring at the planet we thought we'd never have to leave. It looked so peaceful from here, so blue and content and still, despite all the chaos that must have been taking place on it. I couldn't even imagine the violence, anger, terror that must have consumed the population. I wonder what the galaxy killer looked like from Earth's perspective. And then, without remorse, it ripped through Neptune. The planet vanished in an instant, swallowed up without effort. Then Saturn. Jupiter. All the other planets I never cared to remember from class. And just like that, the cosmic juggernaut washed over Earth. The Earth I grew up on. The only one I thought I'd ever need. Just gone. In an instant, the vivid blanket of immeasurable power snuffed it out. No explosion, no crumbling from within, no burning, no shattering. Nothing. The wave continued to tear through space unceremoniously, leaving behind no debris of what was home to nine and a half billion people. Seconds ago, mankind existed. Now, it was just space dust. Not a single speck of evidence that anything or anyone was ever there. The reaction from students was a sorrowful mix of gasps, tears, and wailing. So many still had family left on Earth. The holographic projection stayed on, but there was nothing left to see just a blank wall of unidentified energy. As the wave continued its endless rampage, the sobbing and wailing intensified. A few of us who were quiet just stood there, unsure of how to react. What are you supposed to say after witnessing that? 
What are you supposed to do? It was real now. The shame of ships. Our distant destinations. The whole humanity's last chance spiel we'd been hearing for what feels like ages now. It was all sinking in. A few minutes later, I left the crowded lobby in a daze. I gently pushed my way through the mess of defeated students who stayed. I didn't see Jess anywhere. I wondered if she had anyone. Or maybe she was just like me. I made my way down the harrowingly empty corridor as the sobbing faded and entered my little cubic cabin. The blue light flicked on overhead, illuminating all zero of my decorations and personal belongings. I sat down on my tiny cot, pondering what had just happened. The majority of mankind had remained on Earth. Nine and a half billion people doomed to stay. A little under a hundred million got to leave. After the executive decision was made that a certain quota of qualified professionals were to leave the planet, the rest were apparently random, or so they say. So why me? No education, no merits, no money, no influential parents, no parents at all. So why did I live while well, some poor kids starved to death as the population fought for food? Why was I here when billions burned or got trampled or murdered or turned into dust? That's all they were now, dust. Meanwhile, I was sitting on my own personal cabin, at a comfortable temperature, with enough food on board to last us five years, and a prescription of pills to help my head not hurt so much. My pills. They were in the cupboard above the sink. I forgot how badly my head hurt. Doctor said take a half a pill for a normal headache, one whole pill max if it got really bad. I moved robotically to the tiny sink just steps away, then I saw myself in the mirror. Hadn't looked at myself in a while, clearly. I looked... tired. Not shocked or horrified, just worn out. Blue eyes had washed out into a cloudy gray. Mildly pale skin had tightened around my cheekbones and my jaw. Probably because I kept forgetting to eat. I could almost see the headache pounding through my short, rarely groomed brown hair. I got rid of the sight and opened the mirrored door and pulled out the little clear container beside my toothbrush. There were at least eight pills left in there. The doctor was very specific when he prescribed them to me. These pills can be fatal if more than three are taken at a time. I thought of the poor kid who starved or burned or got trampled or murdered or turned into dust, and the millions, billions of others like him. I'm sure they all would have appreciated this chance more than me. They would have lived, really lived. I was just taking up space. I guess I was too scared to decline when I was offered my spot on Seamus 5. I almost regretted taking it now. Maybe I'd have been better off evaporating with the rest of humanity. My life had no clear path, and ever since I was a kid... I had never found real joy in anything. I opened the container and looked inside. Without thinking, all eight pills poured into my palm. No more than one. It's something I'd thought about many times before. For my psych evaluation, while being selected for Seamus 5, I had lied on all questions regarding my emotional state. Further proof that I was too scared to decline the offer. I always knew that suicide would be a drastic move. I knew that it wasn't a real solution, and that it was more than a touch dramatic. I talked people off ledges before, broke orphans who didn't want the world to hurt them anymore. I told them that life was worth living, that they shouldn't give up hope. I said what they needed to hear. That doesn't mean I believed it. Because I'd stepped out onto some ledges too. Never stepped off, but it got pretty close. So maybe I would do it this time. Why not? It would be quick, simple, painless. Drifting off in a dream didn't sound so bad, though I hadn't dreamt in longer than I can remember. I stood with the dry, symmetrical pills in my hand, staring at them, debating whether or not I should join the nine and a half billion people who had just vanished from existence. For the first time in a while, I felt my whole body begin to shake. The pills vibrated in my increasingly sweaty palm. At least I was feeling something. In a moment of surreal self-reflection, I couldn't believe I was actually considering it. Come on, Rick, don't be stupid. But I had no purpose here, no reason to stay, and no one to miss me when I go. If nothing else, the timing was more appropriate than ever. And then, the alarm roared. The blue light in my room switched suddenly into a harsh, flashing red. The familiar robotic voice on the intercom punched through the deafening ring of the alarm. Emergency! Emergency! This is not a drill. Please make your way to the nearest escape pod and in order... Pop! Her voice cut out. A second later, the floor shook violently. It nearly knocked me over. I hopped to the other side of my cabin and peered out of my elephant glass window, which warped in a manner to let me see along the shafts of the ship. I pressed my face up against it and tried to look past the endless fuselage toward the front. What I witnessed was beyond the scope of what my uneducated brain could process. 
I heard the term cosmic storm before, but like most space-related trivia, I thought nothing of it. Now, it looked like we were heading straight into one. Chapter 3 Whatever it was, it was ten times wider than our ship. Very few things are wider than a Seamus ship. Our craft has dwarfed small moons. From what I could tell, this startling phenomenon was a gargantuan vibrating orb of color. That's the only way I could describe it. Tensing and contracting aggressively like a cramping muscle. Surrounded by nothing but black space, it was blinding, sucking all life and matter into itself, growing stronger with every metric of space it consumed. Suddenly, a massive streak of orange lashed out violently from the enormous colored blob. It whipped out in a flash, slashed through nothingness, and retreated back into its ball. By the looks of it, the bow of our ship had already entered into the storm, like we were being swallowed by a giant fish with a gaping mouth, eating us up without taking a single bite. Then one of the whipping rays of energy struck the hole. The tremor sprinted through the ship all the way to my cabin and passed it. The entire fuselage must have warped to the collision. I imagined the shockwave zigzag through Seamus 5 like the last blip on a massive heart monitor. The ominous creaking of the tremor died out. I waited, irises glued to the storm. Three, four more streaks shot out in harrowing silence. Each struck our craft with more colossal power than the last. I felt the impact rattle the very ground beneath me. I clutched the window frame to stay balanced. The ship was way too big to change course fast enough. We were headed into the cosmic disaster nose first. Over the alarm, the panic footsteps of students thumped in the hallway, screaming. I looked down to the pills still in my hand, then to the raging space anomaly. It looked worse than any bumps we'd traveled through thus far. We did some rough spots over the past few weeks, sure, but the alarm had never rung before. Only for routine drills. The intercom cut out this time, which meant the ship could have some serious internal damage, and the situation would only worsen from here. Without thinking any further, I dropped the pills back into the container and slipped them into my pocket. Outside my room, frantic students whizzed past, sprinting through the narrow curved hallway toward the stern of the ship. There's an escape pod every 400 feet along each section of the ship. I started towards the nearest one, towards the back. I knew exactly where it was due to the emergency drills we'd had this far. Very last pod on the starboard side. The chaotic red flashing lights did nothing but skew my vision. My brisk walk soon turned into a jog. Another violent tremor threw me to the floor. I popped to my feet, and the jog became a sprint. Maybe the impact knocked some sense into my overwhelmed mind. I ran down the deep hallway, past my now empty class, past the student lobby where moments before we watched our planet perish. The hologram was as dead as Earth itself now. The whole room had been plunged into darkness, lit up every other second by a deep red flash. I kept moving, and then I saw it. The escape pod. I skid to a stop once I arrived at the crowded entrance of pod 331B. I peered through the open doors and recognized my classmates cramming into it, knocking each other over, scrambling into the last handful of vacant seats. Suddenly, someone grabbed my shoulder from behind. It was the boy from before, Benjamin. The slicing red lights reflected off his glasses with each pass, giving him glowing crimson eyes. He tried to say something to me, but I grabbed his arm and slingshot him into the pod before he could utter a word. I'm amazed those glasses stayed on this time, as he struck a cluster of students like a bowling ball. But he was in. Benjamin scrambled with the others to find one of the last seats. The pod was meant to accommodate around 30 people, but it was filling up fast. More than 30 students had already piled into the vessel. Must have been stragglers from another class in the stern when the alarm sounded. They tumbled over each other, wrestling for remaining spots. I spotted Ted's big, fat head already strapped in at the back. Looks like he got in first. Or pushed his way through, more likely. I took a rough count of my classmates. Looked like all the faces from class 331B and extras had boarded. Except for... Jess. I couldn't see her anywhere. Our profusely sweating teacher, Mr. What's-His-Name, urged me to enter so we could eject. His hand hovered over the closed door button. We're still missing a student! I yelled over the alarm. He shouted something inaudible back at me and grabbed my arm, trying desperately to yank me into the pod. I didn't budge. His moist hand slipped right off. I scanned the flashing premises for Jess. My confused brain took a moment to ask some pressing questions. What was happening? How was this happening? To a shameless ship, no less. As so soon after the galaxy killer washed over Earth. And then, a figure began emerging. Deep in the hallway... I spotted her through the epileptic dazzle of crimson light. She was sprinting down the nearly eternal corridor I had just come from. Her cabin must have been close to mine. But what was going on behind her? Something unsettling was happening. About ten feet behind her, the red flashing lights shut down. One after another, the emergency lights quit their strobing and died. The thin rows of white lights dotting the corridor disappeared in sequence too. The alarm gradually decreased in volume, halving, and then cutting out completely. 
Only the human screaming prevailed and the rumbling tremors that haunted the ship. The storm must be killing the ship's power, one section at a time, I thought. Jess barreled past the empty cabin doors, past blackened rooms that would only be coffins at this point. She blasted toward the escape pod, glowing like the beacon it was. The relentless wave of darkness chased close behind her like a predator on the hunt. Jess was just barely outrunning it. The teacher tried to close the doors, but I stopped him with a stiff arm. Come on, come on. Her stylish sneakers glided across the floor with no sign of slowing. The darkness was close, but she was fast. Just fast enough. She arrived at full speed, and I used her momentum to swing us both into the pod. Her movement carried me in. Barely. The teacher's wish was finally granted as he closed the doors with a push of a button. Sandwiched between the tumultuous blob of students and the metal doors, I smacked the deploy button just beneath it, a heart-churning blast off. We fired out of the side of Seamus 5 and into open space. My adrenaline spiked so high that I barely felt the pressure. We rocketed from the ship and witnessed the whole phenomenon take place through the 360-degree window of our pod. The storm was even bigger than I thought, swallowing up and attacking well over half of Seamus 5 by now. From here, the destructive force seemed to stretch across all of space itself. Not a single artificial light emanated from our mothership now. Complete blackout. A dark metal behemoth drifting into the hungry mouth of a bright, pulsing monster. My eyes finally broke away and searched for other pods, seeking tiny silhouettes against a blinding backdrop. But no matter how hard I squinted, I saw no such thing. Not a single pod in sight. As we hurled sideways from the darkened Seamus 5, the vivid cosmic hurricane approached us. Fast. It engulfed everything in range, allowing a short lifespan for any debris. Jagged rays crept out in every direction like spider legs. The angle of our ejection only brought us a few extra seconds. The greedy storm grew closer and closer, traveling at a staggering speed. No obstacle could keep it from us. And then, it hit our pod. A muffled boom. The whole vessel launched into a dizzying spiral. Ten odd students who weren't strapped in thrashed around the pod and bounced off each other, Jess and I included. My helpless body tore through the crowd of seated classmates, hurled from one end of the circular pod to the other. I managed to grab a student's shoulder and hang on for dear life. The windows surrounding the pod were suddenly washed out with the palest shades of color, a blinding rainbow punishing our vessel from the outside. The storm enveloped us in a thick blanket like a whiteout blizzard, but amidst the chaos, I noticed something. The pod's internal lights had gone out. That can't be good. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I deduced that the storm likely had the same debilitating effect on our pod as it did on Seamus 5. With our lights dead, it was logical to believe we had no thrusters or communications either. If any of that still mattered. I held on as tight as I could, likely breaking the shoulder of whoever was in my grip, while we barrel rolled through the vivid field of energy. My legs swayed up and down, slapping against bodies I could not see. And then, a particularly violent blast ejected us from the heart of the storm. We somersaulted a dozen more times, fighting back nausea. I tried my best to orient myself. In brief glimpses through the hectic spinning, I saw the storm retreating, fading further and further away, like it was turning around, like it was a sentient being, focusing its efforts on the remainder of Seamus V, the wounded prey. Whatever survived the initial strike was now completely devoured by the storm. My mind still failed to process the situation, nor did I have time to. Before I could even formulate a complete thought, I saw something out of the windows. No time to see what. Spinning. Spinning. We spun and spun until I couldn't tell the difference between my brain and my stomach. Eyes could not land on anything concrete. Blurry. Then they focused momentarily, and I glimpsed the storm at a greater distance than it was a second ago. Clearly, we were moving fast. The ferocious storm shrunk in one direction and something big, bright, and blue came into view in the other direction. It crowded more and more of our view the closer we spiraled. We grew further from one massive entity and nearer to the other, and I could finally make out what it was. It was a planet. But which one? Not even a straight-A student could tell you now. As I said, when things go south, all that knowledge goes right out the window. All I knew is that we were being pulled closer to this planet, which would be a good thing if we were flying instead of floating but I was positive our thrusters were dead, so we floated closer and closer to this blue planet's atmosphere, and, as expected, the floating turned to falling. We entered the atmosphere, and as we did, the pods started dropping fast. The students screamed even louder, impossibly, and then we started dropping really fast. The zero-G disappeared without warning and without apology. Immediately, it was substituted by a violent G-force on all of our bodies. The pod leveled out, seats down, which meant the students who weren't strapped in flew up violently and hit the ceiling, which meant me. 
My back smacked against the hard texture of the ceiling, knocking the air straight out of my lungs. The same happened to Jess and several others. The G-force pinned us all down, or up rather. The painful ringing in my ears made me miss the simplicity of a mere headache. A ring of fire began to build around the exterior of the pod in a purple glow. We continued to plummet through the surprisingly blue sky towards the planet's surface. Our teacher, as panicked as the rest of the class, repeatedly tried pressing the emergency parachute button to no avail. A powerless pod filled to the brim with equally powerless kids. Our heated freefall only sped up. I could see the planet more clearly now through the windows. We were falling towards something just as blue as the sky. Liquid. An ocean, maybe. But it wouldn't matter what awaited us below. Not if we couldn't slow down. We'd all be putty no matter what. I looked along the ceiling and across the forcefully pinned students. I saw something. Something that could save us all. Inscribed on a large gray square were the words Emergency Parachute Manual Deployment. Attached was a large T-shaped lever. I tried to make myself heard over the horrified screams of the other students. The parachute! Pull the lever! I yelled, trying to point it out through the paralyzing G-force. No one heard me. How could they? Everyone just continued to scream. Certain death was moments away. Our downward trajectory to this new planet grew shorter by the second. The teacher kept smashing the same useless button. But Jess heard me. She set aside her fear and gave me an acknowledging look. Then she started crawling with great difficulty toward the red lever. I followed her lead. I forced my body into motion, using my elbows to push and slide. Together we made our way through the scattered students toward the center of the ceiling. The surrounding flames flickered with unimaginable heat. A distant portion of my brain wondered if we'd melt in the sky before reaching the surface. I waved it off and kept moving forward, which, under this pressure, felt nearly impossible. The downward spiral was nauseating. I think I even saw someone's puke rocket upward and splat on the ceiling. But Jess and I persevered without a word and arrived at the lever. We got side by side, and each grasped opposite ends of the handle. Our fingers gripped it with a tightness most people would never need. Then we tried to stand up. It took all of my strength and all of hers. Through the opposing force, we slid from our bellies to our knees, and from our knees to our feet. We planted ourselves firmly on the ceiling and pulled up on the lever. But it was stuck. Wouldn't budge. Standing upside down, the G-force did his best to flatten us back against the ceiling. But we couldn't give up now. The fatal impact would arrive at any second. I felt dangerous levels of adrenaline coursing through my body. The fire surrounding the pod grew to a blazing orange now. I couldn't tell how close we were to hitting the surface of the planet, but if we didn't deploy this chute, then these moments would be our last. I readjusted my grasp on the lever. I saw Jess do the same. We synced up in a wordless rhythm, heaving with all our strength for a second, stopping, and then yanking up again with everything we had. Together, we made it budge. But the lever was really stuck. We had to keep trying. Upside down and disoriented, weakened and confused, we rocketed faster and closer to the planet. Come on, you stupid piece of... Clank. The lever snapped out towards us. The massive parachute unraveled outside of the pod. It instantly caught the wind and blew open. Jess and I jerked back toward the seated students. The others who were pinned to the ceiling also flew back suddenly. I smacked my head off of someone's skull, and Jess landed right on top of me before I could recover, smashing my face back down between the two rows of seats. It was like a can of sardines in here, if the sardines were still alive and squirming for dear life. Despite a throbbing pain in my face and a myriad of sensory distractions, I could feel us slowing down. How close were we to contact? A second later, I found out. Splash! The entire pod made a harrowing impact into the liquid. A temporary crater formed in the alien ocean. The parachute saved our lives, but we still landed way too hard. The combined weight of the students above suffocated me. Their bodies buried me. I saw nothing but blackness for a moment. Limbs squirmed and scrambled without rationale. Then, among the pain and confusion, I felt the pod start to sink slowly. Except it wasn't slow at all. We were sinking fast. I thought these pods were supposed to float. No time to ponder on it. The sea was claiming us. We had to move. Now that the G-force had disappeared, students finally started to separate a bit. I could breathe again. I took the opportunity to shrug off the students and stand. Gaining my bearings, I assessed the situation. What looked like seawater surrounded the windows. The red glow of the heated metal outside was all that remained of the flames. I looked at the exit. When I found it, the worst possible candidate was eyeing it up. Ted. The brute pushed a discombobulated Benjamin out of his way and pressed the open door button. I flinched. Nothing. Clearly, he hadn't figured out it was useless now. But beside the door we entered was another exit. One made just for such an occasion. Manual exit. It was built like a vault door, thick and sturdy, padded with black and yellow rubber along the edges. 
Ted wrapped his big goofy fingers around the star-shaped lever in the middle. He started to pull. The thousands of pounds of liquid behind the door never crossed his mind. Ted, wait! I yelled. Too late. He leaned back and twisted the lever clockwise. The pressure overwhelmed him and instantly barged inside. The door swung open. It whooshed past his nose, barely missing him. But it didn't miss Benjamin. The weaponized door collided with the boy's forehead at full force. The rubber padding did little to dull the blow. I hardly had a chance to see him collapse before the liquid rushed through the pod. The wave struck us all at once. Like a giant toilet bowl had been flushed, an unstoppable flow swirled me around the pod. I traveled the circumference of the vessel in two short seconds, connecting with nearly every body along the way. Then, the current tipped me upside down and plunged my head under. I barely had time to acknowledge that it felt just like water. I slammed into the wall while the pod filled up quickly. Somehow, I managed to keep the air in my lungs despite the impact. I kicked and turned myself around before regaining my surroundings. Through the liquid that now took up most of the pod's real estate, I could see the exit. It was on the opposite side of me, bleeding bubbles into the ocean. We were still sinking at a dangerous pace. The students scrambled frantically, rushing out, or trying at least, as the current of the incoming seawater sloshed them around the pond. The student beneath me panicked and struggled with his seatbelt. The water was far past his head, and mine. He yanked and pulled, and did everything to his seatbelt but pressed the release button. I instinctively clicked it open for him, and he blasted past me, scurrying through the water towards the door. The pressure had ceased, and we were free to move. Many of the students managed to navigate the nearly full pod and exited from the open door. Not in an orderly fashion, might I add. Desperate kicks struck heads and bodies as students tried to save themselves. I swam towards the door, too, while the last of the breathable air disappeared from the ceiling of the vessel. I missed my chance to take one last breath. I decided to stop moving for a few seconds and let the panicking students swim past me towards the opening. The pod emptied itself of classmates, and I looked around for survivors. Then, I spotted Benjamin. Right, Benjamin. He was drifting and very unconscious. I grabbed him by his t-shirt and swam out of the entrance, dragging him behind me. Once out, I spotted students swimming both ways, up and down. Or down and up, I couldn't tell. Had the pod shifted while we sank? No way to know. I remembered an old trick I saw in a movie once. My lips parted slightly, and I let out a few bubbles. They floated out of my mouth, then down my chest, past my leg, and towards the surface. Down it was, then. I towed Benjamin along as I made my way to breathable air. Or so I hoped, anyway. My lungs ran on fumes, making do with whatever air they received before that wall of water hit me. I imagined it was the same or worse for Benjamin, who got knocked out the moment Ted let the door smack his head. The darkness began to subside, and I could see rays of light shimmering through the ocean surface. Almost there. But my lungs weren't aware of that. They tensed and pounded the inside of my chest in protest. Trust me, I thought. I want to breathe as badly as you do. My head finally emerged from this unnamed body of water. I sucked in a big gulp of, well... Whatever this planet's atmosphere was, felt like oxygen to me. At the moment, I couldn't have cared less. I just took another big breath and pulled Benjamin's head above the surface, too. My eyes blinked off the water and darted around, looking for something floating. I scanned nearly 360 degrees until I found, well, something floating. It was land. A beach, I guessed. Looked tropical. I made sure Benjamin's face was still above water. Then I began to transport him to shore. Some students were already there. Others were following behind me. All of them were panicking. I just tried to stay calm, one task at a time. The one at hand, get to land. The peaceful extraterrestrial beach welcomed us as we left our pod behind. Benjamin's heels left two narrow trails in the sand as I dragged him to dry land. I laid him down and then looked around. What was this place? I scanned the soft white sand and the staggeringly tall trees around me. Then I looked out to the horizon at the magnificent morning sun. Then, I looked up. Slicing through a beautiful, uncharted blue sky was Seamus V. The dead spacecraft had followed us. Followed us in three gigantic, amputated chunks. Ten minutes ago, it was intact, floating nonchalantly through space, seeking out a safe little planet where we could start over. Now, it had about ten seconds and counting until it smashed to bits on the ocean surface. I stood on the mysterious beach, staring at the catastrophe. The tropical heat kissed my skin in jarring contrast. Serene waves broke gently on the spongy bed of sand, and then it struck me. I had never been on a beach before. I always thought that my first time on a beach would be on Earth. Earth. 
All right, thank you guys so much for listening today, and thank you to Zachary Wilson for letting me share this with you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you go to chinillo.com slash series slash morningland and check out this awesome book. Go ahead and subscribe, and remember to send some social media love Zach's way. Let him know that you heard about the book on the podcast and that you enjoyed it. And uh, remember, the links are in the, in the description down below. Like I mentioned last time we did an indie author segment, I am looking for other indie authors who want to get their work out in front of the world. So if you or somebody that you know is an indie author, uh, let me know. I'd love to talk with you and uh, see if your book or your story would be a good fit for another world. So that's easy to do. Link is in the description to talk to me, or you can just email anotherworldaudiobooks at gmail.com. Remember to tune in next week. We're going to be starting a brand new book, and I cannot wait to share it with you. Talk to you next time. Don't worry, you aren't the only one. You aren't the only business that needs help. You aren't the only person that has a hard time finding the right help at the right price. This is where Business Bloodline becomes your bloodline to temporary and permanent staffing. Business Bloodline specializes in hiring internet workers to creatively solve problems for your business. Business Bloodline does all the vetting and only delivers candidates that make sense for your needs and at a cost that you can afford. But 60 seconds isn't enough for me to tell you why hiring through Business Bloodline is safer, cheaper, and less time consuming. We would rather show you. To get more information or a business consultation, visit businessbloodline.com. If the job can be done on a computer, Business Bloodline can find a match. Visit businessbloodline.com and tell them that you heard about it on Another World Audiobooks to get 10% off your first hire. Remember to mention that you heard about it on Another World Audiobooks to get that 10% off. Businessbloodline.com